Hello and welcome back to the How to Get an Analytics Job podcast. This week's podcast guest is none other than Gary Fly, who is currently the president of the Brooks Group. He's also had quite a long relationship with me personally. So back three, four years ago, he was running his own fractional CXO business. So this means that he was basically a C-suite executive for hire. I met him in downtown Greensboro, and he actually became one of the founding members of Silvertone Analytics. So in this podcast episode, we're going to be breaking down networking. We're going to talk through the narrative arc of how I met Gary, how we developed a relationship, built a consulting agency, and how he thinks through building meaningful professional connections. Before we hit record this week, Gary and I actually thought through a framework to explain why networking is so important. You could think of getting a job as entering into a house. So there are three ways you can enter a house. You can go in through the front door, you can come in through the back, or you can come in through the side door. The most common way of entering a house is through the front door. And this, in the metaphor of getting a job, is applying online. So using LinkedIn or Indeed or Monster or wherever you're applying. Now, this is by far the most common approach and each job that's posted gets thousands of applications this way. Now onto the second way is through the back door. And this is where companies actively reach out to someone because of their personal brand. They have a strong brand of demonstrated performance and are well known as an expert in their space. This is extremely hard to cultivate and it takes years of demonstrated performance. Now the side door is where networking comes into play. If you know the hiring manager or you know someone who knows the hiring manager, then you can sidestep that front door application process and you can actually get thrown into the fast track and have your resume thrown up to the top of the list. But in order for you to have these opportunities come into your life, you need to have a robust and thoughtful network. In the interactive section of this podcast episode, Molly Welch, one of our super fans, volunteered to come on and we helped her develop a brand new relationship with a hiring manager in her area. What was interesting about this interactive portion is that she had both Gary and I who get tons of inbound requests and messages on LinkedIn to help her navigate making first contact. Making first contact is actually a pretty daunting task because you don't want to come off as overly transactional or as someone who's trying to sell the person something. So me and Gary have a very interesting meta commentary and help her think through how to make that first impression. Spoiler alert, the message that she sent actually connected with that person. We recorded that podcast episode yesterday at 1.30 and I'm recording this intro video at noon the following day and the person she reached out to has already responded not only positively but gave her his email address so that they could continue the conversation. I chalk this up as a win as Molly has now successfully added someone who is a hiring manager in her local area to her network of contacts that she knows. Then we wrap up the episode with Al Bellamy, our social media manager, who facilitates the LinkedIn submitted Q&A. So if you're new to the podcast, head over to LinkedIn and look up how to get an analytics job. There you will find our webpage where you have an option to participate in each weekly episode by submitting questions to the expert that we interview. This podcast episode is brought to you by Panoply. Panoply is a platform that allows you to connect to 60 different data sources where you can connect to your data in SQL, visualize it in tools like Power BI or Tableau, or even analyze it in your favorite programming language. Click the link in the description down below and you can get a free 14 day trial to panoply.io. One more thing before we jump into the podcast episode, make sure you subscribe and ring the bell if you want future notifications about our upcoming podcast episodes. 
Also, the best thing that you can do to give back to us if you're getting value out of these podcast episodes is leave a like, a comment in the comment section down below, or even share this on social media networks. With all that being said, let's jump into the podcast episode. Gary Fly, how are you doing today? I'm David. I'm doing great. It's good to be with you. I appreciate the opportunity to reconnect and I'm excited about our session. Yeah, me too. I, I love that, those wraparound windows. So I know where you're at. You're on the top floor of a building in downtown Greensboro because I've been in your office. <laughs> I am. I am. So uh, uh, the Tanger Center is right behind me. So I'm Elm Street. I'm par- uh, parallel to Elm Street right now. So if you all know where that is, uh, that's uh, that's the back view, and you may see trains in the background. They go through pretty regularly. Oh, that's so cool. All right, so what we're going to be talking about today, Gary, is we're going to break down how you think about networking, because I know, I mean, it's I would say it's well known that you're probably one of the best networkers, have the most robust network of anybody in the Greensboro, Triad, Winston-Salem, High Point area. Well, you know, it was uh, very intentional, right? It takes, um, I think it takes a strategy, if you will. It takes a, a regular amount of energy and um, and you have to do it, I think, with a mindset of not just taking, but of giving. And, and uh, it's interesting. One, uh, I just received an email last night from a, a good friend, Abby Donnelly. I don't know if you will, anybody knows Abby, but she's actually written a book that, on networking, Networking Works. And she shared with me, uh, the email last night was a thank you for an introduction that I made to her in 2017 that turned into a a client for her just yesterday. So uh, you have to have some patience with it as well, right? It's not a, um, I don't think it's a, uh, something you enter into with selfish motives or with a desire for quick turns. I think you really have to have some thoughtfulness about what you're doing and how you're going to go about it. So, you know, it, it, John David, it really started for me in 2020 when we moved to Greensboro and I began, I was a business owner and and wanted to be a part of the local business community. I wanted them to know me. I wanted them to understand what I was doing. And- uh, Would you and mean 2000? To, yeah. You said 2020. What'd I say? You said 2020. <laughs> Oh, no, 2000. Like, you, you've been here yeah, for a year, and now you've got this huge network. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Yes. Uh, yeah. So um, um, so that's, uh, you know, that was really it. Um, and and then, you know, there's a lot of starts and stops, a lot of trial and error, but I uh, feel like I've got a pretty good cadence and rhythm down now and, and happy to talk through it at whatever level of detail would be helpful. Yeah, well, I guess we can kind of talk through and break down how you and I met. Cause I think that from a kind of a professor standpoint of like teaching, I think that it's really good to have like a narrative structure. So I think, um, and there's also a lot of things we can kind of pause and unpack along the way. Like you introduced me to um, Nathan from former CFO of Wrangler jeans. He then came on, uh, my finance committee at Tri Local First, and now he is the CFO of a large nonprofit in Durham. So like those little, but I none of that would have happened if I wouldn't have known you and you were kind of that that vector force between the two of us. So I actually want to hear your perspective on how you met me. <laughs> well, I'll say that one thing uh, that uh, occurs to me when I think about you, John David, is that you have a bit of fearlessness in you. And, uh, and I think that's important, right? You clearly had something on your mind. You were willing to go introduce yourself. You were willing to break the ice and take the initiative. And I, and, and I think that's important. So my recollection is that we, uh, you, you know, prior to, to the, my current uh, uh, job, I had a consulting practice and would spend most of my time on site with clients, but when I was not on site, I would office out of HQ Greensboro, um, you know, the co-working space. And you at the time were also spending time there. And there was a community area where community work tables and the coffee and all those sorts of things. My recollection is I was sitting there or in that area 
and you just came up and started talking to me um, and introduced yourself and asked questions about me and what I was doing and and kind of explained what your situation was and what you were trying to do. And, and that conversation kind of struck up uh, now, I don't know, four year uh, uh, friendship or so, I, you know, multi-year kind of deal. But um, that's my recollection. I, is that uh, clouded or faded in any way? <laughs> no, I think that, okay, let's talk about the fearless point. To give even bro broader, deeper context, the traditional wisdom of starting a business is that you work in industry for five, 10, maybe 15 years and then start like a consulting agency. I did not do that. I, I turned my last internship into my first consulting client and was actively learning while I was building clients. So I was talking about things that I didn't really fully understand. So I guess I, I will take that compliment. It, it was pretty fearless for me to go up there and start talking because I guess I convinced you well enough that, oh, this guy's onto something he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Yeah, you, you connected a couple of dots, right? So most of my clients were family-owned businesses, not real large, but 15 to $50 million in sales. And I had a, a, a belief in analytics, right? So that was something that made sense to me and the ability to tell stories through data and and make decisions through data was something that just it, it, it really resonates with me so as you were talking about kind of your vision and what you were thinking and what you were doing you know I could immediately I could immediately connect dots with clients that said this is the sort of thing that my clients need they 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 can't afford to hire a department they're not willing to maybe even hire one person but on a fractional basis or on a consulting basis this this type of work could bring, bring real value. So that conversation that you were willing to in, uh, initiate really uh, started to connect those dots, right? And so that's what excited me about uh, understanding more about what you were doing. Yeah, and also too, I kind of wanted to break down where, just where you're hanging out. And, and it's interesting now in the time of COVID because you aren't physically, at least most of us are not physically hanging out at, at the office. Although, I mean, I was at HQ Greensboro earlier today. Um, networking has shifted. So I would say to kind of something I wanted to unpack a little bit is that HQ Greensboro is a great place to build connections because there are a bunch of entrepreneurs in there, there are companies, it's just a mixed use space. So there's I don't know, probably 50 different organizations, people from 50 different organizations coming in and out. Um, one thing that I, is coming to mind is that you can take that kind of that same thinking and apply it to where do you hang out and congregate online? So for example, like what we're trying to get at with this live premiere and this live chat is that we're building kind of that, that we're replicating that physical mixed use space where people from different you know, walks of life are, are kind of bumping past, except we're doing it online in the live chat. So the people are, and it's, it's really interesting because I mean, Al's been doing a fantastic job of, of getting people. I mean, he, I've, I've been joking a lot. He's kind of like the hype man. Like he's getting people excited, involved, sending them personal messages. Um, so you, you may want to kind of be a little bit more intentional about where am I spending my time online and what communities am I plugging into? I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and to play off that a little bit also, John David, I felt like the time at HQ, because people had shared desires or they were trying to do the same thing, it became very relational, it was not transactional. And so much of what I think people think about net networking is they think about it transactional. Let me go to this chamber of commerce breakfast meet and greet and hand out as many business cards as I can, right? That doesn't feel very authentic. It doesn't feel, uh, it feels just transactional, right? I never felt that with you. Like you were just trying to further what it is you were trying to do necessarily, but you really had an interest in and understanding what I was doing. And then we had conversations around, are there points of intersection, right? Are there, are there ways that we can combine? At no point did I feel like it was, oh, 
he's trying to give me his business card and he's trying to get my business card. And then he's going to make a LinkedIn connection. And then he's going to use that to mine something to his benefit. It was never those sorts of thoughts. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that um, we, so, so we've, we've actually prepared quite a bit for this conversation off air and what we're going to be getting into a little bit later with Molly is how to reach out to people in a non-transactionary way. Because I get people trying to sell me something on LinkedIn and I can spot it like that. And if you were going to be turning off so many people, if it's like, well, it's if they can kind of, what do they call it? Coffee pasta, where it's like you ha- you've written out a script and you copy and you paste it and you paste it and you paste it and you paste it. <laughs> Uh, people can kind of sniff that stuff out, I think. Yeah, it does. Again, you know, does it feel transactional? So I, I get a lot of inbound uh, requests from insurance agents, financial planners, that sort of thing, right? And you just, it's like, well, and I, I, try, I actually try to think about like, I wonder why that person's trying to connect with me. Is there a reason? Is there some mutual benefit? Is there, is there something that's real and meaty or is it just the next note I'm going to get from them is, Hey, I'm a financial planner from XYZ company would love to sit down and show you these tools, right? That that's where my head goes with those sorts of, uh, uh, of what I think of as transactional things. So I think it's important to sort of connect the dots and again, uh, again, build some rapport, build some trust, show genuine interest, all of those sorts of things. Yeah, I think that's fantastic advice. Okay, so we kind of broke down how you and I met. And I think that there's there's just like a lot of information and kind of insights in kind of seeing how that that relationship that is, has been very fruitful. Because I mean, I think kind of the next phase we can talk about is you along with Ryan Forrest were, you know, third partner or 30% partners in the founding of Silvertone Analytics, a consulting agency. And I think that maybe we can talk through a little bit of that time period. Um, Cause man, that was a stressful time period for me. <laughs> <laughs> what was causing the stress, John David? Uh, Cause you and Ryan kept getting me in meetings where I like, I knew like 80% of what we were talking about. <laughs> and I was like terrible. And, but also too, to add stakes to this, these are like presidents of companies that are, I don't know, they're doing hundreds of millions in sales. And I feel like I'm like, number one, I shouldn't be here. And number two, I don't even know fully what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, again, you, you do have a bit of, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're a bit willing to uh, put yourself out there, which I think is, is part of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think, I think playing off of that, actually, you never pretended to know something you didn't, which was important, I think. True. Right. It, you, you never misrepresented in any of those scenarios something that you were just making up on the spot or you didn't hedge in ways that would cause disbelief or something to come back at you, right? We, right. I, I, didn't, I hope that one of the things you learned was that you can say, well, I'm not sure, let me check or that sort of deal. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I didn't learn. I learned to not lie, lie, but <laughs> if there was additional information, I did. I what do they call that? Lying by omission, or like, like people would get frazzled, and then they would just be like, "Oh well, I don't know this," and because I, I, I there was one person in particular who did that, and you were like, "He's not going to be in any of the negotiation meetings." <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. This is- right. I learned how to kind of keep my cool under pressure a little bit. Although I mean, you called me out a couple times. You're like, "Are you all right? You look like you're sweating." <laughs> well, that's all part of it. You kind of have to go through the experience. But again, I think that, uh, you know, you you started by talking about how now Silvertone uh, was the direct relation, a direct outcome of that first meeting of you willing to come up and say, hey, what do you do? I think it was kind of that bold, like, what do you do? What do you, why are you here? And, um, and being able to connect those dots and then really, um, a, a willingness to, to say, hey, I, I think that data, uh, data analytics is really could be a competitive advantage for, for many of my clients. So let's figure out a way for us to work together and, and come, uh, come as a unified front to, to uh, enterprises and, and start to pitch it, right? And we knew it was going to be a bumpy road. We knew that it was going to take time. We knew that 
things, you know, it's almost like a, when you get a, uh, I don't know if any of y'all have ever had those rock tumblers and you put a rock in and, you know, three week for three weeks, the thing grinds and grinds and grinds. And at the end of it, you got at least a kind of a smooth rock. I mean, it's, that's part of the process as well, right? You start mm-hmm. to learn how to present yourself. You start to learn what to talk about. You start to learn how to um, read an audience and understand what's important to them. So I think that that was just the beginning of that process. So those experiences that were causing you to sweat or uh, squirm a little bit really were those tumblings, right? Mm -hmm. I also wanted to break down too, kind of like your role in this, in that I've I've heard Kevin Kelly, who I don't know if you've ever read, um, he was like a early internet guy. He wrote this, um, this paper or this blog post called a thousand true fans, where it's like, if you can get a thousand true fans and you can kind of make it online. Um, but he talked about this concept called a vector force. So what you are, Gary, in the Greensboro, Winston-Salem area is that you are one point of contact, but you know so many different people. Mm-hmm. And to brag on you a little bit, I think you're downplaying yourself about my consultant, my consultancy. You were a fractional, you were a fractional <laughs> CXO. So right. you would do everything except for the CFO role. So right. Consulting makes it sound kind of small, like, oh, you know, I just solved this one problem. I mean, my understanding of what you were doing, and correct me if this is wrong, it's kind of like when you buy a foreclosed house and flip it. Yeah. You yeah. are doing that with that's- very large, medium, medium to large size yeah. organizations. So that's what it was, right? So, so what I had recognized was a missing piece in the marketplace was companies that were growing often kind of outgrew their ability. So their quality standards might go down, their delivery and shipment standards might go down, their their ability to control profits or their cost per unit might go up. And oftentimes business owners were like, I, I don't know how to solve this problem. And so I would go in as a consultant and would be on site and work with them, not only to diagnose the problem, but to implement the solution. Because I knew that the business owner didn't have the bandwidth to do it, to do the implementation or may not even have the awareness or ability to do the implementation. And so I could effectively extend their bandwidth and get them over this hump, which is why what I thought you guys or what you were doing was so interesting, right? Because again, I think that if you can, if you can get a business owner to really understand how powerful analytics are and you can connect those dots and, and show them kind of the, so what, right? Like, so this is what it means for your business. And this is what you ought to take away from this. And this is some re- recommended changes for you. That gets to be very powerful for them. And so, so yeah, you know, my, my livelihood depended on my uh, ability to, to generate business. I would typically have three or four clients at a point in time and they would go nine to 18 months, but I always, it was, I was always, kind of in the business development mode, which was done through networking. It was done through in-person networking. It was done through virtual networking, right? I, uh, one of the things that I do is I'm very active on LinkedIn and it's very little self-promotion. It's very much more just information that I think might be intriguing or interesting to people. And it keeps my name up in front of them, right? So on any given day, I'll have 250 to a thousand people look at whatever I post. and you know, my, my hope is that what that's doing is helping me build a brand of contributing to their professional growth or providing insights, uh, but it's all around being a source of information and a, rely, a reliable source of information. So it's really brand building as a part of networking. Personal branding is something that we talk about on this podcast all the time. And I think that it's often overlooked so there are two things that I wanted to break down. Number one, the a pro tip of, I know that you automate that. And if you're open to sharing how you automate that, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, we can talk about Hootsuite, but then also too, um, something that you've, you've kind of talked to me about is there are some people who are kind of, they kind of become company men and they are very fixated on just their job function in their company. And they do rise up the ranks, but as you get higher into an organizational structure, you have less and less job security. So all of a sudden they get laid off at 50 and then they're like, well, I've got to start over. Can I, can you connect me with someone? And it's like, well, it's a little too late at this point. Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. So, all right. So uh, I'll go back to Hootsuite. So I do automate it. 
So my routine is on Friday afternoon, I go to a news aggregator called Flipboard and I have set up my preferences. So it feeds me stuff that I think is would be interesting. So I click like leadership, personal development, happiness, and uh, uh, entrepreneurship, I think are the titles. And then I will um, schedule them through Hootsuite for the next week. So Monday through Friday at 820, uh, a push goes out and I always will push, put a little something, I don't write a whole lot, but just a little something about the article or this intrigued me or whatnot. And, um, you know, what I found is that if I can find other, if I can find influencers, so Elon Musk says this, or Warren Buffett says this, or those sorts of things, those get a lot of play. Uh, and then lists get a lot of play, like the top five things you can do to get a raise or the whatever. But I, so I, tr I pick things that I think will be of general interest and benefit that come from reliable sources that, um, that also lever any sort of halo that the author might have, whether it's Warren Buffett or it comes from Forbes or whatever it is. And again, it gets a lot of interaction and it gets a lot of awareness, which is for at least a nanosecond, somebody's thinking about me, right? And maybe that person would need me on that particular day. So that's my view of, of that. Does that, uh, is that what you were thinking about with Hootsuite? And uh, well, I didn't even know that you had a news aggregator. So you're here automating oh. it even more than I thought you were. <laughs> I thought you just sat down on Sundays, did research, and then like scheduled each day, each weekday's post out. So I mean, that's yeah. even better advice than I was expecting. Uh, th this has ah. been a goldmine already. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um, yeah. So the other, uh, to your point, you know, um, pre-pandemic. Uh, I was getting probably three inbound things a week. Hey, I've just gotten laid off or I'm starting to look for a job or wh whatnot. And, you know, I'd worked for XYZ company all my career and I traveled a lot. So I don't really know anything in Greensboro. How do I get connected? Right. So then that starts to be like, feel, start to feel transactional. Like it's, you know, what, what, what I understand what you're after but you know you're 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 really looking for a job and you are trying to understand how to um, get plugged into the community in a really quick way and i think again that's a challenge because people will sense that um and so uh you know the the i think that the the way to really establish a solid network if you maybe think about the strength of the connections is to build it with intention and not be looking to get right away necessarily, right? You may something, some benefit may come to you, but it's really about uh, applying consistent energy over time in a proactive uh, beneficial way that I think leads to real value. Okay, so now I think this is a perfect segue into um, you connecting me with Nathan Carter um, the former CFO of Wrangler Jeans. So he didn't, did you bring me up to him like months before the connection was actually, cause he called me at like 5.30 on a Thursday evening or something like that. It was, <laughs> but, but I remember you mentioning that, hey, I got this guy who's interested in talking with you like two months prior to that. And this was yeah. pre, pre COVID. This was like what? Yeah, a year and a half it ago. Was it was every bit of that I would think, yeah. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> he and I had gotten connected through a mutual friend, and um, he had he'd kind of found himself in that same situation, right? He had left uh, Wrangler, uh, had done a short stint somewhere else, was traveling a lot, didn't know a whole lot about the community in some ways. And as we talked, he and I told him what I did. That was really the premise of the meeting is like, let me understand what you do because I think I have those same set of skills and maybe I can do what you do, right? Um, and and then as we talked, we found some real common interests again around data. And he talked about some of the struggles at at Wrangler, which surprised me in some ways, right? You know, I think of uh, of a company like Wrangler with all the the you know the volume they do and the amount of stuff they sell. I would have just kind of assumed they were really dialed in and it didn't sound like they were as dialed in as as maybe I had thought, but he had a real, seemed to have a real passion for it, which then in my brain says, hey, this makes sense for him to know John David, because I believe 
that John David could um, um, learn from Nathan and understand how a C-suite guy from a Fortune, I don't know, I don't know Fortune 1000, but a Fortune 500, some company thinks about things. And, <clears throat> and, then, and then John David uh, could help Nathan because you understand kind of the, the startup world. You understand what it's like to launch a business and a consulting practice. You understand what the local uh, business uh, uh, um, climate is like. And so you had knowledge that he didn't have. He had knowledge and skill or uh, experiences that you didn't have, but y'all had both this common interest around data and the use of data. So I saw a point of intersection with points of, uh, of benefit, right, for each. So what, in, hey, it's just a benefit for John David, and it's not just a benefit for Nathan, but it's a mutual benefit with points of, uh, of, of uh, intersection. And so that's, as I think about networking and connecting people, I kind of check those boxes. It's like, is it is it good for both parties? Is there a natural reason for them to intersect and, and have a little uh, algorithm, if you will, in my head about that? So that's what you mean when you say thoughtful networking. Like you're, you're actually, you're thinking about the other person and how they plug into kind of the broader environment that you know. So that takes two right. things. Like number one, you've got to know what's going on from, you know, a technology or, you know, an emerging market standpoint, and then also the people who are related to that. Because I think I'm going to mirror just exactly what you said, except for a little bit different. So Nathan loved to grab a beer with me, and he could actually drink a lot more than I could. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about Nathan is he, he's got such a strong personality. It's hilarious. He's highly disagreeable, but also very funny. And I remember I got like a little bit uh, buzz like the first couple times and he would just dominate me. And I'm like, I'm rethinking my, I, I like felt like I had to like curl, ba curl back and be like, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. Cause he would just like push on you, which I like, it totally makes sense why he is the, the CFO type. But I did the exact same thing that you did where um, he was like, Hey, you know, this is, well, he was working with uh, another analytics consultant. Well, they were a technology company that had like a, a minor wing that did some analytics consultant. And he was talking about working with them or kind of starting his own thing. And one thing that kind of that overlapping value, I was the treasurer at the time of Tribal First, and I had been learning about the nonprofit space for a while. And one of the things that, yeah, I hope this isn't overly controversial, but most people in the nonprofit space are not the most financially focused. And I was like, well, if you're looking to pivot, you, you might actually want to come on to my finance committee and you can, you know, help kind of turn Child Local First around. And chaos ensued. It was hilarious seeing <laughs> Nathan, this like, you know, big company CFO type interface with like these very um, gentle, highly agreeable nonprofit people. I just had to like let go and be like, wow, this is, this is hilarious. But he then ended up pivoting to, you know, a much larger nonprofit where he was, I think he's now the CFO or he's, he's got some paid position at one. And I don't want to claim that I'm the one who turned his career around, but I think that I was kind of a, a conduit and it gets back to that kind of that thoughtfulness of how how can what I know benefit you? And I think that the people who are transactionally networking think the reciprocal of that. How can you help me? Right. <clears throat> yeah, I, it's it's funny. So, well, first, let me go back to Nathan real quick. Did he give you any sort of uh, finder's fee or anything? Did he cut you in on any of his salary or? No, not at all. <laughs> okay, well. Yeah, no, I should have got uh, it in writing. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, there's a, one other point that I want to make about before I, I lose it. And that is part of the reason that I am, um, I kind of go through that filtering process or that algorithm is I want to protect the strength of that network, right? I don't want you to get so many messages from me and be like, oh my gosh, Gary's killing me with trying to get introductions or he's killing me with this stuff that doesn't even make sense, right? So I really right. do, and I, I think that goes back to my brand as well, my, right, my personal brand. It's like, I'm not gonna abuse the relationship. I'm not going to 
um, wear you out in any way that if I actually, if I reach out to you, I, I've thoughtfully contemplated, hey, this makes sense. And I think that there's value in it for you. So I think people are more inclined to accept those sorts of introductions because they know that there's, it's not just some fly by night sort of transactional thing that I'm trying to set up. And there, and there likely is no benefit in it for me, right? And so I think that actually adds to the credibility in some ways. But then when I go to ask for favors or need help, they re people reciprocate. Enthusiastically. Pretty, um, Right. Enthusiastic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, like if you need anything, I like you've done, you've provided so much value to me. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not at all annoyed by that. I'm like actually happy to see your email show up in my <laughs> inbox. I'm like, Oh, this is great to where like, you don't, yeah, you, there are risks of pestering people. And I think that like kind of relating it back to the, how to get an analytics job. We talked off air about, that documentary what was it called varsity varsity blues yeah i think that was it i, I had it on my screen and I, <laughs> I i clicked it off so one of the best ways to get a job is to have a, a a referral within a company so you know someone there and you know the guy was completely unethical and what he did was wrong but i do like that metaphor of the house so the front getting through the front door of Harvard is applying and having a great, you know, SAT score and perfect grades and all the extracurriculars. The back door is having a super rich family that donates 200 million to Harvard. And then he created the side door, which is I'm going to bribe the one of the sports teams to open up a slot. I think that we can repurpose that metaphor of saying to get a job, the front door is to apply. And um, we just had Fabio Alamini on last episode, who is an analytics manager. Any job that he posts, he gets a thousand through the front door applications. I would say the back door is we've we had um, Christina Satopoulos who got a job at Google. Google reached out directly to her because of how prominent she was on LinkedIn. So that's use having your influence and kind of your notoriety and like if Elon Musk were asked to you know take over another company. That, that's because of the brand Elon Musk. So the back door would be having your brand get, bring opportunity to you. I would say that side door would be having a really wide network. And I mean, I actually just got a side door into Amazon where I, we're, we're gonna have um, my buddy Danny that I met seven years ago. Um, I met him while he was getting his MBA at Wake Forest and we stayed in touch and he is now a product manager for Amazon. He reached out to me, I think three weeks ago and said, hey, I'm hiring an analyst for my team. You're top of the list if you want to interview, which I feel weird saying like, I don't want to waste your time. Like I'm, I'm happy where I'm at, <laughs> but that would be the side door. And I think that the side door is, it, it's just not thought about as much. And maybe that people just haven't done a great job of, of talking through it. And I, I hope we're doing it in this episode. Yeah, you know, I, I do think that uh, as, you, as you think about, uh, or as a person thinks about, you know, the way companies hire now, these, uh, they get so much traffic and they, you know, they have uh, uh, bots scanning the resumes and all of that stuff. It's very impersonal. It's very transactional. Um, <clears throat> and, 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 it's, and it's just hard, right? You may never hear back from them. You may not know what your status is. It just seems very cold and sterile and um, and kind of a numbers game, right? And so I think that that's, that's, there's no, it's hard to distinguish yourself in that group, right? It's hard to give yourself a leg up. It's hard to uh, connect the dots for the hiring manager in a way that makes that person say, oh, well, John David clearly has something a little different. Let me spend some time with him. It's, it's just, it's a volume sort of thing in a lot of cases. So so yes, yeah, so the idea is well, what what can you do to to try to improve that? And um, and and it was funny when you first came up with that analogy. I was like, yeah, I guess that's kind. Of, I guess that's right, right? Um, and and there are ways, right? There, um, I think if it go if if <clears throat> if you can find a genuine point of entry that has 
some knowledge of you that has maybe some respect for you or trust you or you trust them that sort of deal that starts to that starts to open that side door a little bit and allow you maybe an uh, a, a, an entrance in or an audience um, with with somebody that might have been very hard to get through to uh, in a traditional front door manner well okay i think it's three different points of leverage so when, you, when you're applying with a resume, you're leveraging your credentials. And I think that's the weakest lever because there are so many other people on the, in the job market who have excellent, excellent credentials. In the back door, you're leveraging your demonstrated performance. And I mean, that's by far the most effective way to get a job. I actually had a company reach out to me about running their marketing department this morning. Um, just, they were like, we've seen what you're, do, what, what you're doing with your YouTube channel and how you're, um, that I think is the best form of leverage, but what you're doing in the side door, you're leveraging someone else's reputation. Because if I refer you to fill this job and it's bad, I then hurt that relationship with that hiring manager. And I, and I love right. that it organically came up with you and you mentioned kind of the risk associated with building a network. Because if, you know, maybe once or twice you misread someone and it hurts someone that, you know, is, is in your network, that's okay, but if it happens multiple times, I mean, that's right. that really starts to degrade the overall value. And I think it's kind of that social, that social network effect is really, really strong. And I don't think it's, especially in like a job setting, I don't think it's, it's talked about to death, I think in the entrepreneurship space, but in the job space, I don't know. I think people, the, the mantra is just work, keep your head down and work hard and it'll be fine. Right. And I don't right. think that's, I don't think that's true. Yeah, right. I think that's right. I think, again, you're always brand building, right? And I think it's a form of that. Like, what is the the John David brand? It's, it's hey, I'm, I'm frankly kind of feisty, right? You figured things out. You're, you're, you're um, willing to go out on a limb. You are uh, providing good content that people find that's interesting, right? So you don't have a marketing, I don't think you have a marketing degree, right? No, I have an economics undergrad and then an MBA with a concentration in analytics. Right. And so it's interesting, right? That they would offer you a marketing job with kind of no formal marketing training or no formal marketing background. But what they've seen is the proof is there, right? The proof that you understand how to attract business or interest to you and to what you're doing is there, which is is the is is what they're after, right? They don't care that you don't have the credentials, they see that you have the results. Um, and so you've been brand building in a way that speaks to the to the digital world uh, in ways that's resonating, right? Obviously they think that you're a person that understands how to attract interest. You're a person that understands how to convey uh, relevant and timely information. You're a person that conveys accurate information that's really beneficial, right? So all of those things. So I think that as, as you think about ha having a job uh, and being inside of a company, it's still, there's still brand building around that because, you know, your coworkers will come and go and they may land in an opportunity somewhere down the road that they could bring you in on, or you may end up in an opportunity you want to bring them in on. And all those things, those, those points of connection, the stronger they are, I think the more of those opportunities you'll have. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is kind of meta a little bit about how I'm this podcast, it's got multiple points of, of value because we were talking about this off air of like, we're trying to our best to give actionable advice to those looking to land an analytics job, but also too, it's an excuse for me to reach out to you and have, I mean, we haven't had an, an hour and a half long conversation in like two years. And I mean, right. it's, it's, and it, it's reminding me like how much I did really enjoy, like, having those meetings with you and brainstorming. Cause I mean, you bring a lot to the table that, I mean, it was kind of intimidating at first. I mean, a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, well, again, and, and I think in sort of a, in a, in a job interview setting, in a networking setting, it, there can be a level of intimidation. Right. And so you kind of have to brace yourself for that or be prepared for it and, and understand that, you know, in most of those situations, the per, at least from my perspective, the person on the other side has a genuine interest, right? If they're willing to spend time with you to learn about you, there's a genuine interest there. And it's not, I don't think it's, 
in most cases, it's a gotcha game of let me see if I can trip John David up somehow. But it's really a, a, a let me understand what John David's all about and how and how he thinks and and does he kind of fit in this environment that we have and and let me share that information with John David so he understands how we think and what our culture is like and all those things so that both parties can make good decisions. But at the end of the day, in an interview situation, it is kind of a, it's a weird deal, right? I mean, it's like, you know, you're, you're kind of acting in some ways. So I think that, that uh, going in as confidently as possible and presenting as, as confidently as possible is, is part of it and, and doing it from a genuine point of, of interest and trying to, and to, trying to make those connections like, okay, I'm interviewing for this job and here's why I think I'm a good fit based on what my understanding is. So let me to connect the dots for you, the hiring person um, in a way that kind of elevates my opportunities. I don't Fantastic. know if that, if that made sense or if that was where you were going or not. <laughs> it makes total sense. So, okay, let's actually pivot into the second segment. And Molly, I think you're looking good. Um, Molly's like background blur thing was like messing up. But what we're going to do here is kind of um, talk through, like Molly, you're going to pull up your um, your LinkedIn, and we're going to actually talk about cold outreach and how you can find LinkedIn connections and how to connect with them and then send that first message so it doesn't come off as that transactional. Okay, so uh, would you like me to share my screen here? Yeah. I guess. Okay. So what I did, what I've done is did a basic analytics manager search in LinkedIn um, and have quite a few results. And so I guess as I'm scrolling through trying to find mutual connections, there's this one right here that I have a mutual connection with you. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess Gary's advice was, you know, who it, is it somebody that you feel comfortable reaching out to and asking, you know, um, how how well you know them? Are you comfortable speaking with them? So I guess, you know, how how do I get plugged into their community in a timely manner and be proactive? If, is that if well, Gary, I think what we should do is just send them a connection request. By the way, those of you guys who are watching this, if there are a thousand people watch this, don't everyone jump on this one person. <laughs> this is Molly's <laughs> connection. Don't copy her message. Um, <laughs> Gary, I think, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so, um, you know, the first thing would be, I think it, that Molly indicated was to talk to you, John David, and say, all right, John David, hey, you know I'm interested in an analytics position. We are both connected to Dom. What do you really know him or is this just some tangential relationship on LinkedIn? And if you do know him, let me ask you a couple questions. Do you think it would make sense for me to know him? Is he the sort of person that is doing the kind of work maybe that I want to do? Are you comfortable providing a warm introduction or should I just provide a cold or should I just do a cold outreach to him? And then if I'm doing a cold outreach, are there any things that you know about Dom that maybe I would include in my outreach uh, message to him? So if I'm Molly, recognizing that Dom seems to be doing the kind of work I want and that you know him, those are the sort of questions I would ask you. Is that, uh, you, you kind of follow where I'm going with that? Yeah, so to break kind of the fourth wall here, Gary, you and I have sat in on him. We were pitching SFW, right? And Dom was their analyst. So, so Molly, go ahead and click on Dom's profile. All right. So, how, Gary? How long ago was that? Like two years, three years ago? I bet it was. I bet it was three years ago. Um, I didn't have long hair back then, but yeah. Okay. So, so SFW is. They, they actually do something similar to the longest running client that I do. Basically, they are doing analytics for retail sales. And correct me if I'm wrong, isn't that right, Gary? Yeah, they're, well, they're a full service marketing firm, but they have an in-house research team and they base all of their marketing um, um, suggestions, strategies, and whatnot off of 
original research that they do. So they are really focused on, on research and on uh, analytics, right? So that so they are a analytics-based marketing firm. So they they have a team. I think Dom was one of about five or six mm -hmm. on that team. Um, I don't know if he was the supervisor at the time or if he was uh, an analyst with them. Um, Molly, will you scroll down a little bit? Yeah. Let's see what his specific job function is. So, so he's a supervisor now. Actually, he's probably the ideal person for you to reach out to. Um, so Gary, this is actually a really in, kind of interesting kind of like meta commentary. I only know him because we had one, like what, maybe two or three meetings. Yep. How strong of a relationship is that? That feels very weak to me. It's not like I've never gone and like, you know, grabbed a glass of wine with Dom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what I think then in that case, potentially one, one plan would be for you to say that to Molly. Look, Molly, I do know him. I've sat in a meeting with him, but here's what I know about SF, about they now call themselves Sales Factory. Here's what I know about Sales Factory. And here's what I know, li the little bit I know about Dom. You know, Sales Factory is really innovative in their use of analytics. They do a lot themselves. It's a point of differentiation for them in the marketplace. They believe, frankly, that um, that analytics and, um, and research is a differentiator and it's, and, and it's such a differentiator for them that they're actually willing to put their compensation at risk with clients. So they believe so much in analytics. So, so Molly, if that's the sort of environment that you think in, and they're, and let me tell you also that they're, they got a hip, cool office space. They, they, uh, <laughs> they, they kind of, are all the things you might imagine on a marketing firm, they, they're that, right? They, they really do um, practice all, you know, they, they involve or bring all that kind of cultural stuff in. So then would, it sounds to me like, I mean, that's the sort of environment that they have. Is that, does that appeal to you, Molly? Is that the sort of environment you would want? Yeah, absolutely. So, so then I would, if I'm you, John David, I would go back to, you know, I, I don't know that an introduction from me is going to be very right. helpful, but I think you could craft a note to them, Molly, that says, hey, I was recently talking about SFW, our sales factory, with a good friend of mine, John David, and he mentioned that he had actually met with you and was quite impressed with the way you all base all of your marketing strategies, suggestions, and tactics off of analytics. I'm eager to find an analytics position here in the triad. Don't know if you're hiring, but would you be open to a 30-minute information interview to just let me understand your view of what's important with a new analytics hire and what sort of opportunities I ought to be looking for? I think something like that that weaves together for him Oh, this, okay, yeah, I kind of remember that John David guy. Um, I think he was with Gary Fly, so he must be, he must be great. <laughs> um, but then you're asking, like, you're asking for like advice and you're, and you're, you're not saying, hey, I want to come in and just pitch myself for a job, but I'd like to build a, you, you know, you're doing work that I think is interesting and would like to understand maybe how I could get plugged into that community. So you've connected some dots for him and you've not left it out. You know, it's not a mystery to him why you've reached out or how you found him mm -hmm. or, or what you're interested in. And it's also not feeling like you're going to go there and say, and by the way, would you hire me? Right. Right. Much more, again, an intentional relationship building thing that, that maybe he would respond to. If I got an inbound request like that, that's something that's much more resonates much more highly with me than, you know, just a blank uh, uh, request for connection type thing. Okay, so my mind's okay. going three different places. Number one, how solid of a connection should you have in terms of the relationship to that third person? Um, number two, let's just go ahead and write the message and send this off. And then maybe Molly, we can check in and we can see if he responds. And then number three, Molly, will you scroll, scroll up a little bit? Sure. So he has got, scroll down. He has got 252 followers. So that this tells me that he probably is not getting a ton of messages. So um, 
I get, I don't know, probably 10 messages a day. It's, it's, it's getting a little bit unmanageable, but this person is not like out there kind of like a, a prominent figure in the analytics space. So a message coming from you that's well thought out, I think is going to resonate a whole lot more. He might actually be really flattered. It feels very personable. Right. Yeah. And, and so John David, back to your first question about how strong should that relationship be? I think it's a clear answer and that's, it depends, right? <laughs> I think it depends on the person. Like, yeah. would you be comfortable? Do you think it would add value and would you be comfortable reaching out to Dom on Molly's behalf? See, we ha have not kept up with him. Right. So I don't it, know. It would feel a little out of place from my perspective. I think that back actually, so one thing that everyone needs to know, I have a terrible memory. I think he actually came to one or two of the Tableau user groups back when I was running that in Greensboro. So I think that we'll have a little bit more of a connection, but um, yeah, it, it, it just doesn't feel like, I don't know. It'd yeah. be hilarious if he's follow, watching the podcast and he reaches out and he's like, hey. That's what I was just thinking. <laughs> and the pressure of this message, you're on a podcast right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, so I think that in that, in your, in this particular case, then I don't know that a warm introduction from you is going to, from you, John David, is going to move the needle a whole lot. But I do think that if Molly references you and the fact that you had met them and were intrigued by the work they were are impressed by the work they were doing at SFW and as you and she talked about um, companies doing innovative work they were at the top of your list that sort of thing right it starts to make it because it's it's true right it's they are doing innovative work uh, and and for an analyst for somebody interested in data that's a pretty great gig to have frankly I mean they you know so they work with interesting companies they do innovative stuff uh, and they and they believe in the power of data, right? So it has like this really strong pull, I would think to, to somebody that's looking for a data sort of job. Yeah, I do um, like your suggestion that the message reaching out doesn't have to be about uh, Dominic and John David's uh, relationship at all, but that it could be, this is what I've heard about your company and this is how I have found reaching out to you. And one thing that I wasn't thinking about also is reaching out to somebody um, who works for a company that doesn't have a current job posting. Mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting um, perspective, something yeah. that I wouldn't think to do. Yeah, so what I think that does really, Molly, in a couple of things is one, it now creates a connection or and uh, and, and I think it's a, it's a People enjoy it, right? So I'm flattered if somebody says, "Oh, I, John David, I'd like for you to come on the podcast and talk about this." Right? That's flattering to me, and 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 so I'm appreciative of the opportunity. Again, I think it adds to kind of my brand. So it's there's some selfishness in there, I suppose. <laughs> um, but um, but but it's genuine. And and then you know you guys have a known common interest. You and Dom both have an interest in the use of data to understand some riddle, right? You're, you, you all, uh, so there's, there's already some inherent commonality between you. So, you know, I think that there are a lot of natural things, uh, natural reasons to reach out. Um, and, and the information interview is something that I am, I get a fair number of requests for. And I understand that that person might want to work with us, but they also are not forcing that, right? So it's not a weird, awkward, like uh, dynamic there. It's a, it's a much more sincere kind of thing. Okay, the I'm gonna push back is, on you a little bit. What? Well, I actually finished your last point. I think last point. information interview is a little stiff, but okay, that could well, just be me. Talk. Let's have a conversation about it. Let get to your last All point. Right. The last, uh, well, let me think if I can I remember it now. Oh, the last <laughs> point is, that he clearly, Dom clearly has, is working in this environment. So while even if Sales Factory doesn't have something, he may be aware of other opportunities, right? And be now like, oh, you know what, Molly? VF is hiring and here's what I know about them. Or one of our clients 
is hiring and let me connect you with them. So you don't really know where that will go. All right, John David, what's what? what so what gonna, just like an informational. So I think, okay, how old is Dom? He's probably what, 30, 30 ish, give or take four years. I know, it's hard I, for me to tell. I, I, well, I think that, okay, if someone were to reach out to me and say, I want an informational interview, it would come off like, oh, this is what your guidance counselor told you to do. Okay. Um, That's fair. Yeah. To where like, it's, it feels a little bit less genuine than, hey, I want to learn more about analytics. Um, can we go and like grab a coffee or a drink? But I do, as I'm saying this out loud, I'm realizing I, the male female dynamic, I, it, it, that might be a little bit of a gray area to where like he may feel like, oh, is, is, is she trying to like ask me out? <laughs> So uh, I think there's a couple things. One is that what you want to do is you want to time bracket it, right? So Dom's okay. not thinking it's going to be three hours or eight hours or what, what's Molly expecting. So Molly, I think if you say, hey, look, I'd like 30 minutes and, and it's perfectly fine to use your own voice, uh, you know, 30 minutes. I'm looking for a job in the uh, data analytics. Would love to be in a triad. You're doing exactly what I'd love to do. Can I pick your brain for a half an hour to understand how you got where you are, your view of the job market, your view of what's important for employers? You know, do I do I have the sort of skill set that employers are looking for, or do I need to beef up on my tableau work or whatever it is? How about that, John David? So okay, this I see your logic. I just think it's wrong. <laughs> That's okay. What do you think? Uh, okay, so let, let me root this back to like, okay, and maybe we, we just see things differently. And I, I welcome that, like if, if people have different perspectives. So, okay, let me tell you about what happened last week, actually. So I have been wanting to make more connections in the Greensboro entrepreneurship scene. And Joe Rotundi is the founder of The Forge, which is a really cool makerspace. It's actually, I think it's attached now to, no, it was, it was attached it now has its own space to HQ Greensboro. Um, Joe is on the board of uh, Launch Greensboro, which is the startup incubator. And he reached out to me, uh, like just doing a follow-up survey. And I was like, hey, um, you know, I, I would really would like to learn more about the Forge and also just kind of start building more relationships. Um, can we grab a drink at Little Brother, which is a bar that's, you know, right in the heart of downtown. And he was like, yeah, sure. And then I liked it being open-ended because he could have left at any time to where I see your logic though, of like 30 minutes puts bumpers on it. And if it's a good conversation, it can go longer. So I, I see what you're saying there. Yeah. So and, I'm torn. And again, this is a, this is a, this is a, a little bit more, I think of a professional interaction than what you just described. Right. John David, I think mm -hmm. that, you know, you and he, had at least a hint of a of a interaction and an introduction and a, a relationship. What what I see that Molly's trying to do is establish kind of a professional connection in the in the business world with somebody who may or may not be hiring, but also could potentially be uh, a help as she's looking for opportunities in the triad. And so I think it, there's okay to have a little bit of formality around it. It doesn't have to be stiff or stilted. It certainly could be, uh, it, certain, the language should fit what the natural language you would use, the, those sorts of things. But that's the way I view it. And I would respond to that if, in a way, again, in a professional setting, that makes sense to me. Now, I, you know, maybe that's just kind of where I am and, and the way I think about things and maybe Dom's completely different, but, but I think something too casual, maybe, yeah. maybe. I, um, I can see your point there. Um, Molly, let's, let's send this off. Let's, let's add this connection. Uh, can you share? Um, okay. Yes. Yeah. Let share share LinkedIn. Share it's funny how this, like this worked out even more perfect than I thought. It, who knew that the person we had a meeting with three years ago, Titching Silvertone, had then got a promotion to be an analytics manager. I mean, the, the like the, the intersects here are amazing. There you go. <laughs> All right, so.
connecting with Dom. All right, so add a note and then take Gary Fly's sage advice. And we are going to harshly critique you. We're going to what? We're going to harshly critique. <laughs> OK. So no, I'm kidding. Is, I, I, I'm writing a note now. OK. <laughs> uh, hi, Dominic. Um, I guess I should have his profile open while I do this. And I can't. Uh, this is probably awful for the people who are just just listening and not also watching. I, 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 okay. I, yeah, I can feel your anxiety, Molly. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about being in the hot seat here. Yeah, I, I was not expecting to um, actually be, be doing it. So, no. hi, Dominic. Yeah, don't put uh, deer. What cracked me up about? <laughs> <laughs> Two of my students, one of my students in their first uh, interaction with one of my clients, they put dear so and so. <laughs> that cracked me up. That's not something I would ever say in person, so I won't type that. <laughs> Zane, uh, I don't know. Yeah, so, Molly, I don't know if I don't want to put words in your mouth, but here's I, I could imagine it starting something like this I'm reaching out to you on the suggestion of John. John David Arrington and Gary Fly. I recently had a discussion with them about uh, analytics opportunities in the triad and the innovative work you're doing came up. Would you be open to a connection? Something like that. I, that's the theme I would do, however you might phrase it. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I do like that. Or <laughs> uh, I can't type when people are watching me. So Gary, let's let's talk while Molly Molly craft the message in the background while me and Gary will we'll yeah. talk. Okay, yeah, that feels much better. Thank you. Yeah, I can Ooh. feel the pressure. On you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the trick, right, John David. The trick really is, I think, again, connecting dots. Like, why why am I getting this inbound request? Mm -hmm. Is it a, a fishing exhibition exhibition for our? for a job is it are they going to be trying to sell me something or does it seem like a genuine person to person human to human sort of contact that maybe makes some sense that i would be willing to engage in right that's kind of it for me at the end of the day as i think about it right yeah you don't want it to be like hey dom are you having x problem and it comes off like a pit wait did you send it already <laughs> no 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 I did not. I just had to look sales factory. Okay. I can't move the box. So yeah, sales factory. Oh, are you gonna, back here. but um, yeah, you just don't want it to come off like, like you're trying to get something out of them. Um, and also too, I think right. Dom's probably going to be flattered that Gary, you and I remember him. You know, I mean, not that we're like, uh, we'll see if he remembers us. us. Oh, I think he remembers us. <laughs> you remember how, <laughs> well, so Jed, cracked me up because uh, he was so impressed that our data scientists got a master's degree from like, what it was at UConn or something like that. He was, yeah. yeah. Ooh, wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but no, cause I think that they're doing the work, very similar work to what we were, I think they just innovated. Um, yeah. No, I think I they did it. come to a Tableau user group though. Cause I think they're using Tableau. I could be wrong. They were. They were at the time, I believe. Um, so, so yeah. Um, again, I think that um, that just having this, you know, some thoughtfulness behind it shows a desire for a real connection. And it, and then if you get that opportunity to sit down, I think it's good to have a couple of questions. Like, you know, tell me, tell me what's important when you're hiring a new data person, or what. You know, how did you navigate your career the way you did? And just, you know, you have two or three questions just to get things rolling. Leave them sort of open-ended, but let that other person start talking. Because again, I find a, a huge benefit in establishing rapport is allowing the other person to talk and share their story, share their thoughts, whatever it is. They'll, they'll be convinced that you're a great uh, conversationalist if all you do is just listen to their stories. That's true. You know, I just had the thought, like, I could ask Dom to come on the podcast. 
Yeah, See, right. That, hey, that's you a, get some uh, inbound uh, LinkedIn request, Dom. You want to come do this? <laughs> um, I'm running out of. Okay, Molly, that's a lot of text. I think it's okay, though. I think you'll be intrigued. Yeah. He's a data guy. Well, I officially cannot type anymore. So okay. <laughs> now I'm working on shortening this. Okay, so it's, hey, Dominic, I came across your page after a conversation with John Date. You can just erase my last name. That's taking up unnecessary space. I think he's going to going to know, and Gary Fly, who were discussing the innovative, yeah, okay, that works. Um, how about, so this is an interesting, con like, from a relationship building, Gary, do you think the, the ask should be in that first message? Because that seems a little forward to me. I, I, no, I think, I think it's okay. I, my, I, I could see you, um, just ending it. So do you have, after the word love, do you have the ability to write connect? Yeah. I would love good. to connect. Yeah, that was the goal. Yeah. So, ah. That is yeah. the exact number of characters I can use. Uh-oh. Uh, if you don't put that period, he's going to think you're sloppy, Molly. I'm just <laughs> uh, well, I know how I can do that. I'm... There we go. Innovation. Exactly. I mean, I, I think that it's okay. I mean, I think it's just good. Okay. I don't think it's good. <laughs> I was going to say, just because it sounds too <laughs> enthusiastic. Yeah, no. I think it's not wretchedly horrible, so. Oh, great. I feel confident. <laughs> okay. I think the ask is just the connection. So I don't think you need, I'm curious to learn more about the work you do. If you just make that line, would love to join your network. Yeah. And then, uh, and then a sign off reading, then you got space. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah. Because presumably you're going to continue talking to him and then you can tell him, yeah, I'm curious about his work or right. referral or what have you. There you go. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Cause that, that's my thought of like, there doesn't have to be like a, let's get 30 minutes on the books off of this very first message. So you, you kind of have to feel it out a little bit because he may be super busy and doesn't have time and it's just not a great fit right now. But all right, Molly, are you going to send okay. it off now? Um, all right. I am curious. How about I would just love to connect? Yeah. There you go. How about just connect? Oh, that's fine. And learn more. And more from you <laughs> to connect and more from you I'd, I'd be happy to connect and learn yeah all right okay you can send that off wow we put a pin in it Molly you are now officially out of the hot seat and we're jumping into the <laughs> Q a section you can relax great <laughs> thank <laughs> good, you for good the advice good job <laughs> All right. I'm sure um, the next time we'll do that list. Um, I know we've got a couple of students on the call. Do um, you guys have any questions? All right. Angela's just popped up. So no questions. What about you, Shay? Why is it stuck on her? Weird. Oh, it's I pinned you randomly <laughs> by accident. <laughs> All right. Well, it is 252 students. You guys can go on. I hope you enjoyed the guest lecture for this week. Al, I'll, I'll let you take over with the Q and A. Okay. Yes. Shay, check your Instagram you. up. I tagged Thank you on the picture. Bye, Angel. <laughs> Y'all have. Hey, Gary, how you doing? I'm good. I Al. Say hi at the start of this. Yeah, yeah, it's good to see you. I, I like the, uh, I like the, uh, the photo there. Yeah, it's 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 become part of my brand, so I got to stick with it at this point. Right. I I thought about changing it, but uh, yeah, people know me for it now. So. There oh, that's go. right, Gary. Your son's a, a, he flies planes, or doesn't he? Yeah, he's an A-10 pilot. Oh, awesome. Wow. Yeah, those are, uh, those are vicious beasts. Yeah, those things. yeah so he's, uh, he loves it. And, uh, and so we, you know, I get dialed into the, the, the military stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good for him. So uh, are you ready? Have you seen uh, how, how we do our questions? I have not. Okay. This is a new thing you know it's been a while since you're on the show i think so yeah yeah we, we started doing this uh what about about two months ago john david 
Yeah, too much. This just sort of evolved at some point. Yeah. So okay. uh, yeah, actually, so Gary, this is this is a lot show, better but... format, don't you think? Then because I well, you were one of the first yeah, yeah. interviews. Like yeah. Looks like we're get, having a little bit of lag on, on the internet. Episode four. Oh yeah. Episode oh wow. Four. Yeah. Back back in single digits over a year ago. So. Yeah, I think he was he was the the episode right before uh, Fabio. Fabio was number oh. five. Wow. Yeah. See, I have to go back and delve into the archives <laughs> of how to get an analytics job. Uh, in, in my my position as the social media. That's manager. funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to memorize the numbers of the guests. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they're like your little children. Little number four, number yeah. five. That's funny. Well, good, good, good. Well. Yeah, no, this has been good. And did, did, did that section go okay, you think, Al? Oh, yeah, that was great. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm always surprised. Um, the, the times I was on the show, I was just kind of talking about how to use LinkedIn. So I'm always surprised at uh, the, how little people understand about just using the sort of basic search functions, mm -hmm. finding jobs, finding people. Um, so yeah, that was kind of a uh, an eyebrow raising moment for me at the, at the start of the episode when you showed him how to search for for people and we kind of muddled through how to find um you know managers at companies and molly and the student said oh i, I had no idea um yeah so yeah i feel like john david maybe it's, it's time to queue me up for like advanced uh, advanced linkedin or something yeah. for episode you know what I've been thinking about, actually? Um, so Kristen, I can't remember her last name. Kristen Pryor, I think. She has 76,000 followers on LinkedIn. I was thinking That's about right. maybe you and her can do like a tag team LinkedIn episode. Or maybe you could interview her about LinkedIn and I can just enjoy the sidelines. <laughs> yeah, if she's got 76,000. I'm just going to grab a cup of coffee and listen to her talk. <laughs> yeah, she's, that's, that's big league. So... Uh, so we have five, we have five uh, five questioners, one doubled up. So we've got six questions for you, Gary. Are you ready? I'm ready. Now some of these might uh, might be more for John David, but I think you can dig back to your uh, your Silvertone days and, and remember you've done so many things as a businessman. So um, so we have a, a follower named AJ Parmar. This is the first time he's asked us a question. He asked, when getting into consulting. Is freelancing an effective way to get your foot in the door? Um, it it was for me. I mean, that's yeah. what I did, right? I, I was on my own and went out, uh, was not a part of uh, any sort of uh, organized company. But there were a couple of things that were, I think, critical for success. One was understanding where I could bring real value, right? So I had to have a clear value proposition on how I could come in and, and add benefit. The second thing, this may sound crazy, is I branded and came up with some processes, right? So I wanted to appear real, like it wasn't just me coming in and wandering around and understanding uh, what was going on, but I had a process. And, and my process was a, was a three-step process <clears throat> that I called the three Ds. And it was problem definition, uh, solution uh, design and then solution deployment. So I called it define, design, deploy, right? But being having just a couple things like that um, makes you feel seem uh, real, which builds confidence. Um, and then and then it's important to have a couple of stories or or case studies to demonstrate. So. You know, what people want from you is a solution. They want you to help them solve some sort of problem. And your skill set needs to line up to that. Your experience needs to line up to that. And your process needs to line up to that. So those were the things that I believed helped me. Now, all of my, I think all of my um, gigs came from referrals uh, and so it was all around networking, frankly. And so I had a, I had an idea that I needed to have a hundred cups of coffee a year. And I, so that meant most mornings I was having a breakfast and or a lunch, uh, with somebody that was either a potential client, a referrer of potential clients or a previous client that maybe I just needed to reconnect with. I want to go back to the referrer of potential clients. That was people in my case, like business bankers, bankers that would loan money to the types of clients I was interested in working with, accountants, 
fractional CFOs, attorneys, people that were already interacting with the kind of clients I wanted to be involved with. So that's kind of how I went about it. Um, you think there any other follow-up to that, Al, or did I, uh, did I miss anything? Um, no, I mean, I think you, you hit it pretty hard. I mean, the, uh, first of all, your three Ds sound very similar to a, a military decision-making process. So I'm a big fan. <laughs> very um, good. But yeah, freelancing, I think it's, uh, you know, when you take your, your clients there, it's, I think it's a little, probably a little easier to, to get clients from freelancing. And then, so you use leads from that to, to either leverage into consulting clients or then to, to, to figure out who you needed to have, uh, have cups of coffee or lunches. Right. With. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Exactly. exactly. That makes sense. Um, and we have uh, Shruti Jain uh, from Chennai, India, is, is asking, uh, and we'll, we'll limit this because I get the feeling this could this could take an hour or more. Right. What are the major challenges you might face in the initial stage of a startup? Let's go with three. You can give us okay. three things. Um, the real clarity and focus on what it is you're doing that's going to add value somewhere in the marketplace. Why? why will people buy from you? What yeah. do you have? So having real focus around that was what, number one. Secondly is, uh, again, for me in the consulting world, when I was doing the business, it was hard to develop the business. So I, so that's why I had the breakfast and lunch deal because I knew I'd, I'd have those three times. But being very consistent and rigorous around business development, even when I'm executing at the same time. So that was the second thing. And then fr frankly, the third um, was kind of cash flow management, right? You know, it's okay. it was uh, it was uh, fits and starts, and so good times were good and the bad times were bad, and so you had to have enough money to carry you through. Um, and I think that I think that if you get behind on uh, your your cash, you get behind on your billing, you start to accept things that aren't good for your business. You'll take jobs, you'll rationalize what you can and can't do. And, and you'll start to make decisions that dilute your brand, probably lead to bad results for your clients and probably ultimately hurt your ability to actually um, build a business and an enterprise it, it, the way you want to. Yeah, that startup capital is key. Yeah, right. So we have uh, Sean Tom Ryan, call him the man with three first names. He's asking, uh, what's the number one piece of advice that you would give to someone starting a consulting business? Wow. Um, the number one piece, I guess it's, you got to persevere. I mean, I think that, um, it takes my, I've worked with a lot of startups and it takes longer, it's harder and it takes more money and you're, uh, than you often ever ex believe that it will. So going back to the original question of having clear, or one of the questions earlier, having really a clear definition of, of the value you bring to the marketplace is important and having a really intentional business uh, development process is critical that you can maintain day in and day out because it's like, adding bricks to a load. It's not, you know, it, it just, each one adds a little something and each one adds a little something. And so it's a very much of a cumulative thing. Uh, it's not one and done for sure. Okay. Good one. So uh, Deepa Sarajam, uh, I let her get two questions in. So uh, she asks, uh, how can you build a unique personal brand when you're new to a field? Oh, interesting, right? Um, well, I think there are a couple of core values that you need to have, and then it'll allow you to have some flexibility. If you're new, if I think you you want um, integrity, honesty, curiosity, and helpfulness. If you if you have those as your sort of core um, um, methodology or or core values, then people will give you a little grace. I think, frankly, but I think John David is an excellent example of this, right? He was new to the to the uh, consulting world. He was new to the data analytics world, but he knew um, he he, had, he 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 went into situations trying to provide real benefit and real value. He um, uh, never overstated what 
what he could do or couldn't do. He had clarity around how he could benefit companies. And he had curiosity around understanding their problems and really plugging those things in. So I think people were willing to, um, to um, engage with him because he had those pillars of core values there. So I think that because she, this, uh, they're new, they need to really maintain those sorts of values uh, and, and that will allow them to, un, to, to build a personal brand that they can be proud of and that will bring them long-term benefit. Okay. Wait, I've, I've got some things to chime in on this. So wait, will you re rephrase the question so I've got it like queued up exactly the right brain? Yeah, sure. It's, um, so how, how do you build a unique personal brand when you're new to a field? So I think the, the value, the, the kind of unique value proposition I had is that I had like, if, if I were like a video game character, it would be like 95% sales skills, like 13% technical skills. <laughs> and then I slowly built that up to where they like, they kind of caught. Um, but I, I think that you need to first sell and then kind of once you have success, I guess that this is kind of like where my, like I, the innovation I'm going through now is I, instead of having to go out, I now have, the, it's like reverse flow. It's like, I have opportunities coming my way. And that's because of the leverage I have from, I mean, the courses and YouTube. So I think that getting established first is you've got to get some of those wins in. And that's very, um, you have to sell that first. And that that's kind of, the more of the pressure point. Gary, I see you. Um... Yeah, I, I don't disagree, but I think that that having really, I think you had these columns of values that you maintained, right? Mm -hmm. That you were naturally curious. Okay. So you were curious, like, how do I, how can my solution plug in? So let me understand what the customer's real problems are. You were honest and open and you didn't overstate your abilities. You were, uh, you were willing to, to, um, to reach out. So you had this, um, uh, um, I forget how I said it earlier, but you were um, uh, undaunted, right? You fearless. were uh, you're fearless, right? Yeah. And so I think as we talk about your personal brand, you having those pillars of the brand allowed you to do exactly what you talked about, right? It allowed you to go out and solicit business. It allowed you to, uh, and even if you made mistakes, people didn't, you know, they didn't cut your head off because you made a mistake because they knew these personal values were already there. These are these seeds of the brand, the John David brand were already there. Okay. Yeah, I could agree. Essentially what you're saying is I'm selling myself short. <laughs> I think you're selling yourself short. And I, and I think it happened organically so you didn't necessarily think about those things because that's how you're wired up right mm -hmm. for all along since i've known you you've talked about providing educational content right that's been something like you want to educate people on analytics and how they can be successful in analytics and how they can use analytics well that's been a thread and a theme since day one you weren't thinking about podcast and and youtube channels at, at that point you were thinking about how can i bring analytics into into uh, commercial settings that help business owners be successful, right? But it's the same theme. Yeah, that is a really interesting kind of narrative arc. I started teaching presidents, CMOs, high-level executives about analytics. And then now I'm people who are, you know, in college, brand new, don't, haven't right. even got their first job yet. That's an interesting, right. I, actually, I said this in one of the previous episodes. I feel like I've like outsourced my education because I can like the, the material, because I can see how it's being applied and the decision that my clients are making. And yeah. I can kind of take those mental models and then like, like this is silly, but my students at High Point University last week, they went got all excited because I showed them how to take a survey data and build an interactive dashboard that can help people find like um, specific niches that resonate well with the product design. So we could filter like, you know, how would you rate this product one to five, hardware one to five software, and then could filter it on like age, gender, location. And they were like, wow, that's so cool. I didn't come up with that. One of the, one of my clients from years ago figured that out. 
or like we're like, right. hey, can you do this for me? <laughs> right, right. So I think we need to we need to jump back to something that Gary said, and uh, I, I think we found the title of John David's autobiography, and it is "The Seeds of the John David Brand." <laughs> See that in all caps. There you go. Fearless. Yeah. Or dauntless, either way. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we're we're gonna let Deepa Sarajem ask a second question this week, and it is: apart from having a rock star LinkedIn profile and building a portfolio. What else would you do to network with people established in your field? I don't know if it's um, been asked and answered already. I, I think we've we've definitely touched on it at uh, different points throughout the session here. Yeah, you know, for me, the the whole thing about networking is putting myself in proximity to people that I'm trying to engage with, right? For whatever reason, whether I'm trying to bring them some value, whether I'm trying to build business. And so how do you do that? In the pre-pandemic world, it was often around physical proximity. So um, I was involved, for example, with the Piedmont Business Ethics Award. And that was Rotarians and academics and bankers. And, and so it was really intentional effort first to figure out who I wanted to be around. And then secondly, how can I be around them more? Can I join a LinkedIn networking group that they're in? Can I join a trade association that they're in? And can I speak at that trade association? Can I provide content for that trade association through letters or blogs or whatever? Do I comment on uh, things that they're posting on LinkedIn? Those sorts of things. And so it's really about getting clarity on who it is you're trying to bump into and then figuring out a way to bump into them, whether it's in the physical world or the digital world. Um, I, does that, you think that, does that answer that question you think? I, I think that's great. Yeah, and in addition to all the other things we've touched upon, uh, I think that, that gives us a good picture. So our uh, final question is from uh, one of our show favorites, Pooja Chavan, we call her the data mom. Uh, <laughs> she asked, how would you approach networking differently as an entrepreneur or a consultant, as opposed to being a staff employee, what what are the differences you have to have to worry about there? Um, I suppose the motive is a little bit different, right? When I was um, when I was an entrepreneur and owned my own consulting practice, a lot of what I was trying to do was. I really had two objectives. One was to understand the marketplace. What's going on? What are kind of current trends? What are people? thinking about where are pain points, are there things that are changing, that sort of thing. And then secondly, it was all around business development. How do I keep my name in front of potential clients or potential referral sources in a way that doesn't seem uh, um, um, insincere, in a way that doesn't seem overwhelming, but does keep me out in front of them regularly. I suppose as a, uh, an employee, uh, you know, you, you may have different motivations around that. It could be, hey, I want to enrich my career and let me go and understand, you know, Tableau users. So John David has a, had a Tableau users uh, group. And so let me join that and then I'll, I'll build my skills there. Or it could be potentially around, um, you know, let me, I, I want to be more involved in community type stuff and take my skills and plug them in there. So maybe I'm now a part of a, of a local community board or, or something like that. So I think that it's like understanding the purpose of it is the first step and that inside of an organization, your reasons for being out and networking and doing that sort of thing may be very different than what they are as an entrepreneur. I don't know, did that come, did that, does you think that delineates it or is clear? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that was great. Okay. So Gary Fly, sir, son is an, is a Warthog pilot. Uh, yeah. That's the super fan quiz. You've done well. Here we go. <laughs> here's a, uh, here's a 30 millimeter from his uh, first round. Uh, uh, so the, <laughs> obviously there's a, 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 a new uh, top was put in, but yeah. So yeah, he, he's, a, he's enjoying that. that. Those things will ruin your whole day. <laughs> right. <laughs> So awesome. Well, Gary, this was fantastic. I feel like we went so much deeper in this episode and I, I love the kind of getting that. It, it almost felt like, um, like on ESPN where they do like the sports play by play. 
<laughs> we have Molly typing and we're like, no, say this. <laughs> um, I, I, I loved getting your kind of insights and your and unpacking your thought process on that. I think it was fantastic. So thank you. Good. Well, I hope it, this does provide some value. Always trying to help and glad to be a part of it. And, and, you know, you guys are doing some neat work. So congrats. Awesome. Well, so do you mind if the podcast listeners add you on LinkedIn? No, they can add me. I've actually had a fair number of inbound requests over the last uh, three days. Really? Okay. With people that have data, data tags in their name. So I figured that they were a result of this. And then well, I taught them well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then that post has gotten, I don't know, the thing that I pushed out got about 15, 18, 2000 views, I think now. I don't know what it is. Wow. Awesome. What's weird is that LinkedIn created two calendar, two LinkedIn events when you shared it. Because I think we've got like 150 people signed up on our, on our end. Uh, it's getting, getting close to 200 now. Nice. <laughs> so I was going to look and see if I can tell you how many people. <laughs> I'm sorry, 1,270 views of it. Nice. That's awesome. That's remember. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's wrap up the episode. For those of you listening, go add Gary and don't scalp Molly's contacts. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you guys. All right. Take care, everybody.